Dr. Pedro Bento is a small animal veterinary internist currently working in private practice in a multi-specialty practice in Massachusetts. He obtained his DVM from Escola Universitaria Vasco da Gama College of Veterinary Medicine in Portugal in 2008. After a year in private practice, he moved to the United States to complete an internship at Washington State University. Dr. Bento did not match for a residency the first year he tried, so he spent the year at Washington State University serving as a community practice clinician. In 2012, he moved to New York to complete a small animal internal medicine residency at Cornell University and achieved board certification through the American College of Veterinary Internal Medicine in 2015. He joined the internal medicine department at Michigan State University. MSU, as an assistant professor for one year, then moved on to work at a private practice in New York, and after that, to the practice in Massachusetts, where he currently practices. He is a former member of the ACVIM Rating Committee for the General Exam, and is currently a member of the ACVIM Rating Committee for the Internal Medicine Specialty Exam. He has also been a member of the Internship Selection Committee at Cornell, and the Internal Medicine Residency Selection Committee at MSU. Dr. Bento enjoys all aspects of internal medicine, but is particularly interested in gastroenterology, hepatology, and hematology. In his free time, he enjoys spending time with his family, outdoor activities, and traveling. Dr. Bento and his wife, who is presently an oncology resident, also created a blog called VetMed Survival Guide to help future veterinarians and future veterinary specialists learn from their experiences. For future veterinarians thinking about pursuing specialization, Dr. Bento has written a book entitled How to Navigate the Veterinary Matching Program, an insight Insider's Guide to the Pursuit of Veterinary Advanced Training, which is available at vetmedsurvivalguide.com. Welcome to the podcast, Dr. Pedro Bento. Thank you so much for being here. Hi there. Thank you for inviting me. It's a pleasure to be here. Well, it's a pleasure to have you. I have so many questions for you. Good. <laughs> I usually begin by asking, why, why and when did you decide you wanted to be a vet? Uh, that was a long time ago. I was back in high school, and to me, back in the day, it was always about the thrill of the diagnosis. And both my parents are human physicians, just family uh, doctors, and they both always told me, "Don't be an MD." And I'm like, "Okay, well, um, I'll I'll think about it." Um, and then along the way, I just realized that I really didn't want to deal with people per se um in terms of you know all the diseases that then when you go to the doctor everyone's sick and i didn't really want that um so veterinary medicine just came naturally following that and i was always very divided in terms of which one i want to do and, and then it just happened i ended up going to, to vet school so when you say you didn't want to deal with people it was sort of a feeling like, oh, people are gross? Yeah, kind of, yeah. Because the dealing with people in terms of dealing with the pet parents, then obviously that's part of our job. I, I don't think that back in high school, I, I realized that that was such a high uh, component of what we do. But uh, yes, more on that, yes, people are gross and I don't want to deal with all these other diseases. Um, so... Right. I think um, most of us have have that uh, sentiment about uh, human illnesses. I don't know if it's uh, evolutionary. <laughs> you know, I don't know. <laughs> we have an instinctive uh, drive to avoid sick people. Um, but so very interesting. You went to school in Portugal, Escola Universitaria Vasco da Gama. Yes. Like, tell me what what was that like? It's totally different from the U.S. There's, there's no comparison there. Um, I was not taught by any board-certified person. Um, and we don't have, we do have teaching hostels, but they're not as large as here in the United States or even the U.K. 
Um, so at the end on your senior year, a vet school there is five years plus your senior year. And uh, you go out of the university to, to do that senior year. Um, so in my case, I did half of, of that at a private practice, small and small private practice in Portugal. And then I did half of the, the, re the remaining half at Washington State University. And they had an externship program. And that's, that, that was my first introduction to the American system. Let's call it that. So it's a five-year program, and um, you don't go through an undergraduate college program first like we do in the United States. Is that right? No, you go straight from high school, which is, which is great. So I started vet school when I was 17 or still. Oh, my gosh. That's, yeah. a, that's amazing. I mean, I remember when I was 17. I had no idea. I mean, I thought I had an idea what I wanted to do with my life. Yeah, it's pretty crazy. Yeah. It's, I agree, that's 17, I you think you want to do something, and yes, that's what I want to do, but I'm, I'm sure that for a lot of people, there's going to be, it's going to be difficult. Mm. And may I ask, what was the cost of your education from, for a DVM in Portugal? Compared with, with the U.S. is, is very, very different. Um, my school was a private school, so I think it was... I believe it was around 7,000 euros a year, something like that. And the euro is, what is it? Is it like two to one? I don't know what it is now because uh, I've been here for so long now that uh, <laughs> I don't really uh, look back. But I, it's not that high. Um, it's probably 1.3, 1, 1. something like that. So it's probably 10,000 less than that. And that was a private school. That sounds very affordable. Yes. yes. Incredible. It's affordable in term, in to the American standards, though, because the, the economic uh, situation in Portugal is completely different from, from here. So that amount of money is, is, is a lot more than um, what you would expect here in the, in the U.S. So I presume that you were born in Portugal, grew up there? Yes. Yeah. Um, did you have any classmates that were from the United States or other countries? No, no. Um, everyone's from, from Portugal. Um, as, as far as I remember, there was definitely no one from the U S or UK. Um, cause if, if you're from there, so there are students that you know, that go to the UK for vet school. Uh, I, I don't know exactly the cost comparison, but there's no point in going to, to Portugal for vet school, especially because we don't have any AVMA accredited schools, which then makes, makes it a lot harder for if you want to come back to, to the States as, uh, as an American citizen. Or, um, it, it really doesn't work that well. There, there are tests that you have to do for equivalents. And I, we can talk about that more if you want to, because I didn't do those tests. Uh, per se, um, but it just makes it a lot harder for you versus if you go to, to England, if, um, for example, the Royal College is uh, AVMA accredited and, and you can just come back to the States and practice and get a state license, no problem. Right, right. And you mentioned that there, you were not taught in vet school by board certified specialists, mm -hmm. um, as typically what happens in the United States, unless you're doing community practice. Were they veterinarians? Were they... Yes. Yes, they, they're, no, they're, they, they were all veterinarians. I think that for, for certain um, courses, just like in the U.S., they were not veterinarians, but they were, um, let's call it experts in, in, in this type of whatever course it was. And they just were not board certified people. Um, they were just like here, PhDs, etc. But no one had a, a board certification like like here and that was one of the things that really I wanted to see how how things were different and looking back you want to know well okay well all these American veterinarians are being taught by board certified people and these guys have all these letters after after their name they must obviously they're very very smart and all these veterinarians are so smart as well because they're being taught by them so uh, I want to see what the deal is and that's what led me to to want to go the options were basically uk or or the us and back in the day i, I just sent a bunch of emails to the various schools to, to say hey 
this is me. I'm, I'm, I'm interested in doing some, some time as my senior year. Can, do you have an externship program in, in Washington state? I, I don't think it's available anymore, but they did have the, the externship program, which was great. And that allowed me to, I think I spent three or four months back in 2008 uh, at the hostel and, and it was great. Wow. Oh, and was this the first time that you'd been to the United States? Yes. And it was, it was January, uh, and it was, obviously it doesn't really snow in Portugal, and it was, it was a bad winter, so there I was um, in the middle of winter. I remember flying from Seattle to Pullman, Washington, just leaving the, I forget what the, the plane was, but it was one of the big planes, and, and then moving into one of the, the tiny little planes with uh, um, turboprops, whatever those things are called, and it was snowing and I was like, okay, well, this is not going to go well. <laughs> but it did. Everything went, went fine. And, and, and then I eventually went back for my internship. Okay. I, I want to, we'll move on quickly, but I just want to know like, okay, so it was a five-year program. Your DVM program was a little bit different in that way academically, but how did you feel in vet school? Were you, you know, a lot, a lot of American students, when they get into vet school, they're overwhelmed it's very stressful. Um, what, what, what was your emotional experience? It's been, it was, a, it's been a long time. Um, I don't think I, I definitely was not aware of all the, um, the challenges and, and the struggles that our profession faces back then. Um, the whole, um, difficult clients, um, mental health problems that, that affect our profession, um, quite a bit. I definitely was oblivious to all of that. Um, so was it stressful? Yes, it, it was stressful because it was, it was vet school and, and there's, there's uh, a lot of stuff to, to learn. No matter, again, no matter how, I think this applies to every, every stage of your career, no matter how good you are in high school, you're going to go into undergraduate or, or in my case, vet school. And it doesn't matter how good you are. You're, it's going to be a lot harder because there's just so much more to know. Um, and then same thing, if you go into your senior year, uh, it doesn't matter how good you were in the classroom because now it's completely different and so on as you, as you move forward on, in, in your career, going for specialization or not. Um, so yes, it was stressful and it, it, you just have to, to go through it. Um, but I think the, the, the struggles and, and the challenges are very similar there as they are here. So after you graduated, you worked for a year in Portugal in private practice. Tell me a yes, little bit yes. about the, your experience of the transition from vet school to private practice in Portugal. I think the main transition was actually going from being at Washington State and, and seeing how things were in, in a state-of-the-art teaching hostel to go back to private practice in Portugal, which from a financial standpoint, as I mentioned earlier, it was, it was much different. There's no big workups necessarily. Those are rare, I would say. And, and keep in mind, I've been away from Portugal for, for a while. Uh, so things are, I'm sure, are a little different, but still the, the financial component and the cultural component are still going to be somewhat similar. Um, but I think that the, the difference between Washington State and going back to private practice was, was the main, the, the main not struggle, but the biggest challenge, because obviously as I was, what, 20, 23, something like that, 24. And I went back with all, all these amazing ideas and all, all these amazing people that I work with. And, and then basically just most of the times I would hit a kind of a brick wall in terms of, well, we can't afford that or we can't do that. Um, so that was a little challenging. And that's what, and I knew that I wanted to, to go for, for um, advanced training, but that year was, uh, it was, it was good because it gave me that prior practice experience and in, in not at a referral hostel that uh, it, it's good for everyone, really, at least to know how it is. Interesting. So... Uh, I think a lot of, uh, you know, uh, people who graduate from U.S. veterinary schools, uh, unless they go into a specialty practice or they go into uh, a high quality ER, they have a similar experience in day practice um, where, 
that you're not doing as high a level, uh, you're not doing the fancy things, but did you have, did you not have the resources as a hospital in Portugal uh, or could you still offer them, but people just didn't have the money to pay for it? You could still, ho- we, you, yes, you could, you could offer um, certain things. No, we did not have a CT um, or, or an MRI or anything like that. Um, but but yes, you could offer those those things. Most most people would not go for for it. Um, I, I remember one one case where there was a, a dog that was hit by a car, and obviously it needed X rays and, and needed surgery. And, and the answer I got back was, "Well, can you just put a cast on without even any diagnostics?" And I'm like, uh, "No, this doesn't really work like that." Um, so. Again, that is not the necessarily the um, the rule, but you can still do basic workups, just like in general practice here in the U.S. Now, obviously, the cost of, of things is adjusted to to the the reality of uh, of Portugal, um, but it's it's definitely not as as what you would expect uh, at a teaching hospital or uh, any referral practice. There are bigger practices, and again, if you're in Lisbon or bigger cities, that's a little different. There's going to be those um, small pockets with, uh, where there's a lot more money, and they allow you to do a lot more things. Mm-hmm. And so is that why you decided that you wanted to come to the United States to do an internship and ultimately a residency? You wanted to practice the high-quality, fancy, fancy <laughs> kind of medicine? Uh, yes and no. Um, I did know that I wanted to, to specialize before, um, even doing that year in private practice. Um, really, I wanted to be a surgeon when I, when I was in vet school. And, and then when I got to Washington state and I worked with the internists there, uh, at the time, then I was like, no, definitely don't want to be a surgeon. I want to, I want to be an internist. But yes, um, going, there was really from that point on, there was really no going back in terms of this is what I want to do. I want, I'm really big on quality of medicine and, and patient care because that's really why we do what we do. And, and by we, I don't mean specialists or internists. It's every, our profession. Uh, and, and those things, if, if they're not there to me, then there's no point in, in we're not playing doctors. Um, so there was really no going back from that high quality medicine, high quality of care to, I'm going to call it something lesser uh, in this context. Uh, obviously, we need to work what, what we have and what resources, financial resources our uh, pet parents have. But you know what I, what I mean. I do. Yes, I do. Um, okay, so then it, was it because of your externship at Washington State that you, you were able to get the internship at Washington State? You think that probably played a role in it? Uh, yes, it did. Um, it was an unpaid internship. Uh, yes. <laughs> but it, it definitely made, if I hadn't gone to, to do that externship, because my letters really were from, from the, the clinicians at Washington State. Um, there's, and this is, you, you probably know this, and then for whoever's listening to us, the letters are really what, what the main things for your application if you're looking for, for an internship or a residency. There's no other way. You, you want to avoid red flags, but if you don't have good letters, then you're, you're not going to get a position. So it was the, that unpaid internship was really the um, getting the, the foot on the door um, into the American um, system, basically, because I was not going to be a competitive applicant to go through the match per se. So I still had, I didn't go through the match, but I still, I believe there were still other candidates for the same position. Uh, and being there then definitely before that gave me an advantage to to get land that position yes yes okay I, so i can understand why you would take an unpaid internship to get your foot in the door of the american academic system but how did you live right uh so <laughs> pull, luckily pullman washington is not the the most expensive place in in the country uh, and, and basically i i used all my savings from, from back home so to to go through that year um because it, it was it was something that if I had missed that opportunity, I wouldn't be here and and I wouldn't be where where I am today in my career. 
So it was tough. It was, it was definitely hard, uh, especially as an intern, you don't get paid much to begin with and you work a lot and working a lot and alongside other paid interns, it definitely, it makes, makes it hard to, for some days you you think, well, why the hell am I doing this? Oh yeah. I can but imagine. Looking back, it, it was good. It was, it was wor- definitely worth it. No, I, I think it's very logical, your reason for, for accepting it. I'm just wondering, I, I never even heard that they were veterinary unpaid internships. The, yeah, they're usually not, not advertised per se. Um, but if you look on the, on the match website, there's actually a, a category that you can select and it's, um, it's unpaid. There's usually not a, a lot of positions for obvious, obvious reasons. I still had to go through the same. It's not that I said yes and everything went away. Excuse me, not went away. Everything went into place. My app, I still had to put an application together, just like if I was applying to the match. I still went through the their internship committee. They still voted in terms of, oh, you know, is this person going to be a potential adequate candidate? We w- would we rank this person for for the match? Uh, and with the difference that it was. Um, an unpaid position. Huh. So, so um, just a moment, I want to touch on reading your book, How to Navigate the Veterinary Matching Program, Insider's Guide to the Pursuit of Veterinary Advanced Training. Um, you mentioned some, some statistics in there about um, indicating how competitive it can be for veterinary internships and then even more so for veterinary residencies. And uh, my understanding is that even if you want to do an internship right out of veterinary school, well, you know, you might not be able to. I think it was 66%. Is that, am I remembering that correctly? For an internship, most people will get an internship uh, right off vet, out of vet school. But there's obviously a lot of, of people are not going to match. My wife, for example, she didn't match um, for her internship. She had to scramble, which is... Basically, on match day, you get uh, when you open the, the website, you you get a message saying "Congrats, you you matched here," and you get all happy, or you get a message saying "Sorry, try again, you didn't match." These are the open positions, and then the scramble is basically candidates and programs that have open positions trying to um, to match together, and that's going to be a direct process. It's not going to be be through a computer software per se, um, but. The great majority of um, of interns are still going to match. It's it's highly competitive, and it's getting more and more um, because there's more and more applicants each year. For residencies, is is a completely different ball game. Is is that's much much more um, competitive. Yes, I remember being shocked when I it was something like thirty three percent of people wanting a residency get them. That's yeah, amazing. And, and on the, the VRMP website, they actually now give you tables that allow you to look at and tell you exactly how many programs are, are available, how many positions are available for a certain specialty, and how many matched at match time and how many had open positions. And, and then the percentage of um, match for, for, for that specialty. So that's, that's a lot more information than back in the day when I applied in 2011 and 2012 for residencies than it was available back back then. It doesn't change anything in terms of your application, but it gives you an idea of what you're what you're facing. So um, before we talk about your residency, just give me a, a brief recap of your experiences as a, a veterinary intern there at Washington State. I, I'm sure it, it must have been pretty rigorous. Uh, yes, yeah, so it was hard, um, but that's hard for every every um, intern uh, in the country and uh, overseas. That there's no no um, easy path there. Again, going back to what I said earlier, you go from vet school, and yes, I had a, a year of experience in Portugal, but it really doesn't. No matter what you've been doing, it's not, unless you were on a high um, high volume ER practice, you're not going to be ready for. For it, especially, I started on overnights to begin with, uh, and and that was because I had that year of um, of experience. So that was, I mean, I would say less than ideal, <laughs> but just because it was it was a, a new place, a different country. Back in the day, my my English wasn't as 
nice as it is now. Um, and, uh, and, and again, overnights was, was always, and is always scary for, for everyone. It would be scary for me if it was now, because again, I, I don't really like emergency medicine. Um, so if it, I was doing it now, I would be, I would be probably, um, similar as I was back in the day. Uh, and it was, there were some crazy things. That was this dog. I, I very much remember second day of overnights that uh, was in the, um, in the runs and had a, I forget what type of surgery, um, had, um, totally stable for a couple of days. And, and then the students, as they were doing their rounds, um, through run through the runs, they, the dog was dead. So there I was second, um, second night of overnight starting my internship and starting to do CPR on, on this patient that it was just, uh, who knows what happened. It just obviously arrested and, um, some unforeseen complication after being stable for, for many days. So that doesn't, that makes you, makes you think, uh, well, what could I have I done different, which you couldn't have done anything different. Um, and there, there's a lot of things you learn a lot during your internship. You work a lot, but you, you learn a lot. Um, and, and those, some of those, uh, experiences and some of the mistakes you're going to make, not necessarily ER, you have people to, to catch your mistakes again, as you were in vet school. And as you're an intern, you have backup. That's, that's what I've always told students during my, um, all these years is that this is the time for you to learn how to be a doctor and how not to, um, repeat some of those mistakes because we're here to, to catch them to some extent, but you need to put the, the effort in to, to even think as a doctor, as you're a student, um, that's, that's, a, that's really important. So it was, it was challenging as in, um, any internship. Um, luckily it wasn't super ER, um, focused because again, um, the ER service was not that busy. Um, Pullman, Washington is, is in, the um, East uh, region of, uh, of the of the state. Uh, it's five hours from Seattle driving, and so there's there's not going to be a, it's not going to be a um, Angel Memorial downtown Boston type of ER practice internship, for example. What I've always wondered is, you had backup, you had somebody to call when you were on your overnights as an intern, right? But being uh, being a brand new intern, I mean, I know you you want to prove yourself. You 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 don't want to bother your professors in the middle of the night if you don't have to, right? And uh, I know that uh, that a lot a lot of interns struggle with that. Like they'll think, oh, you know, I I think I should just handle this myself instead of calling. And did you have that same sort of struggle going on in your head? You always do because you don't want to be calling for, let's call it stupid stuff. Um, but they're on backup for a reason, uh, be it the residents, be it the, the faculty that are on clinics with you. Uh, so I would say that if you're, when in doubt, it's better to call. It's better to be told, well, this was, you didn't really have to call me for this because you should know this by now, or no, this is actually not a, a concern. You're, you're concerned, but I'm not concerned. That's what, what you expect to, uh, to happen in a, in a case like, like this, whatever the case is, uh, versus trying to do it all by yourself and, and then not call someone. And then something really bad happens because you missed something or you thought it was not going to be uh, significant, likely relevant for that and then the next morning might be too late and there's you don't want to be again you don't want to be yelled at it's not about being yelled at it's about doing what's best for the patient so i would say then when in doubt call them because it's they're your backup they're there um to to pick up your call and and help you out because they have more experience than you do Yes. Did you have any experiences like that where you vacillated in your mind? Should I, should I not call? You decided not to call and then regretted it? Not to the point of it was detrimental to the patient, but I think those thoughts were always happening with regardless, regardless of what, whatever the patient was. It's a, a patient in ICU is not going to be a stable patient necessarily. They might be they're probably not going to be dying in front of you. Um, that will happen. But um, you, you have that 
in the majority of cases, you have the, the ability to, um, to say, well, should I call now or I'm going to reevaluate in, in 15 minutes or half an hour. You don't want to be calling for every single little thing. Uh, it's like, oh, well, blood pressure was 115 an hour ago and now it's 110. I'm going to call because it's going down. Well, no, you're going to, you're going to see what happens. If you're that concerned, you can, you can do it again in, in 15 minutes, half an hour, depending on what the case is. But yes, the, should I call now or should I call in an hour after I reevaluate the patient? Um, those are always, always there. They should be because that means that you're not just on cruise control saying, oh, yeah, this is all good. I'm, I'm, I'm the master of this ICU and everything is under control. It's nice when you feel like that because all the patients are stable and there's really no complications, but there should be still something in your mind saying, huh, am I missing something? Yeah, that's very interesting. Um, I think that, and especially new clinicians, they, they, they just want to appear competent and they don't want to bother anybody. And uh, everybody that I've ever talked to who's done an internship or a residency has said, you know, much better to get scolded by your attending for calling when you didn't have to than right. to not call when you should have. So Right, yeah. And, and depending on your program, there will be... There will be people that don't want to be called and they will be grumpy on the phone in the middle of the night. But you know what? It's not about if, if you're on call, you're supposed to be called. It's not about you. It's about the patient. So if you don't like to, to be woken up in the middle of the night, well, too bad. But your patient needs you. So wake up and, and do something. Yeah, I agree. All right. And then so you mentioned in your bio that um, you applied for a residency. Uh, you wanted to do an internal medicine residency, but you, you didn't match your first year. Nope. I, I sure didn't. And that was right after the, the unpaid internship. And, and then it's when you, don't ma- when you don't match, it seems that the world is collapsing around you because in your mind, you just think, well, I suck. No one wanted me. I didn't get a position. What the hell do I do now? Um, and it's, there's no way that you're not going to feel like that, but it doesn't really mean that no one wanted you because the match algorithm is not necessarily the case. There were people that still wanted you and ranked you. Uh, it, you just didn't happen to, to match with, with those because they ranked people higher than you and those people ranked them higher as well. So when it was your time, those positions were not available. Um, so that was tough. Uh, I ended up scrambling. Uh, I did get second place in, in two other residencies that the were, that had an open position and second place means you didn't get a position still. So that was, th- those were challenging months because it was no after no. And eventually I did get, um, I actually had three rotating internships, um, lined up in, in the UK. Um, I applied for those. In Europe, or at least the UK, you apply directly to each program instead of going through a centralized matching program. So I sent, sent applications even before the match results um, were, um, were finalized so that, again, I would have other options. And I did end up with three positions that I, I said no to all of them because eventually I, I figured that, I mean, I gambled that staying in the, in the U.S. would be best for me uh, in, in, in terms of trying to get a position next year or the, year, the following year. And, and luckily that, that worked out. Right. And so you and you are I think you were also lucked out when you, you uh, were hired as a, um, a, a professor in the um, a, a general practice uh, at the hospital. Yes, that was that was a position that was created for me um, specifically um, because of that was a lot more behind the scenes, but there was a lot of conversations in terms of okay, what can I do to improve my application for next year? Is it going to be better to to go to the UK for a year and then try and apply for North American residencies the year after, or um, is it better for me to just stay in the U.S. and they they had they were short staffed in community practice at Washington State, so that's where that um, into play and um, I was I was lucky that I could do um, I was basically doing almost a, um, a part-time community practice and following internal medicine um, the other uh, the, the rest of the time so that allowed me to get that 
teaching experience with, with the students following my internship and then still following the internal medicine cases and, and kind of getting to work on, on getting stronger, stronger letters for, for the, the following year. That was really great of them to, to yep. put that together for you. Yeah, it was, it, it worked out, out fantastically. And again, it just shows that if, if you put in the, the effort and, and you, they see your effort and they perceive that you're a, a talented clinician, things can, can happen. And again, it's not because I didn't match or you didn't match. It's things are sometimes happen for a reason. Mm hmm. So then the following year, you actually did get your uh, residency at Cornell. Yes, finally. <laughs> and um, you mentioned um, again in your book, navigating the veterinary matching program, you, you mentioned that, wow, if you thought intern, OK, if you thought vet school was hard, you ain't seen nothing yet. If you thought internship was hard, you ain't seen nothing yet. <laughs> so yep, that's, that's how it goes. You. You wish you could start um, start your residency, hit the ground running. You start and you hit the ground, and you take a while to get up. That's basically how it is. You're you're from a learning perspective and and um, learning curve. It just it just a brick wall because um, you think that you might be a fantastic intern with fantastic letters of recommendation, and you feel fantastic because you just matched for a residency, and then you start and you're like, oh shoot. This is hard, but that's how it goes. And then it goes, you have about six months to, to get used to it. That's usually, at least that's what it took me. That's what it took my, my wife um, to, to go to kind of be, oh, I'm struggling and no, okay, this, I, I, I can do okay. And this is, this is not as bad. And that's what happened to my resident mates as well. It's um, the six month mark is typically where you, you feel a little more comfortable. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So, I, one thing I remember from when I was a fourth year veterinary student is the interns seem to be sometimes, well, sometimes kind of mean. <laughs> and then the residents also could be mean. But what I also noticed was the interns tended to be more mean. <laughs> than the residents, but the the first year residents were more mean than the third year residents. And I remember um, one resident in particular had a reputation for being not very nice at all in his first year. But by the time he got to his third year, he was one of the nicest people. And looking back, I realized they're mean because they're under so much pressure. I mean, you guys are, not only is it an incredibly steep learning curve, but you guys are supposed to be teaching the students or teaching the, the, the interns. Did you have that experience? It's, it's definitely hard because if you're an intern, a few weeks ago, you were a fourth year student, right? You were just on your way to be Become, become a doctor and then you've got your certificate and now you're a DVM and now you're expected to teach fourth years. And, and you're like, uh, I don't really know what I'm doing, but I need to teach these guys. And I, I think that to some extent, obviously it depends on personality to begin with, but to some extent it's because you're, like you said, you're so stressed and you're trying to do your job and there's a whole lot more that you have when you're an intern or a resident compared with uh, when you're a student. And, and you don't really see that when you're there. Um, so if you're a fourth year vet student, you don't really know what's behind the scenes of being an intern or being a resident or being a faculty for, for all that. You just see these people working all the time or you see these people going someplace and you just assume they're hiding in their offices, which is not the case most of the times. Um, they're just dealing with other responsibilities that you have no idea um, they have. Um, so again, th there's a lot of stress, um, and, and some of those grumpy moments can also be brought on by the students themselves. And I'm not blaming anyone here. Like I said, there's personalities, there's interns and residents are going to be mean when they don't need to, or anything close to that, um, and faculty as well. But as I, as I alluded to earlier in the conversation, when you're a student, you're supposed to be thinking 
as a doctor and acting as a doctor. You're not there just passively waiting for someone to feed you information. You're supposed to, if you're seeing a case, you're supposed to come to me or if I'm faculty or intern resident um, to, with a plan. You're the doctor. I'm just there to, to be your backup and help you and steer you in the, in the right direction. So if you come to me and you have no idea what you want to do um, uh, and you're just, oh, yeah, whatever, um, just tell me what I need to do, then I'm sure that people are not going to be appreciating that, that attitude because what are you going to do when you go into the real world? When you're a DVM and, and you're seeing real cases, uh, they're actually your cases, um, you don't have the backup. So I remember being somewhat grumpy at students and, and even interns when I was a resident because of, of that reason. It's think as a doctor, you're the doctor, use me as your backup. If you're totally off track, I'm going to tell you, no, that's, this is the, where you made a mistake. Um, and if you think about it this different way, then that's where we should go with this case. But definitely, definitely uh, there's too much grumpiness in, in veterinary hostels um, in general. <laughs> oh, it's a pressure cooker. <laughs> All right. And the, so um, after you finished your residency, you actually joined the faculty. So you became an internal medicine professor uh, at Michigan State University. Mm -hmm. Yep, I, I passed my test, in, uh, which was great. I actually found out that I passed my test when um, the board certification when I was driving to, to Michigan. So that was, um, that was good. Uh, I told my wife not to check the results, but she did it no matter what. And she called me. <laughs> <laughs> I'm and sure she wouldn't believe... have called you if it was bad news. Right, right. And then I didn't believe that she, it, it was real because um, I had her, um, obviously she had the login and password to check it. And I was like, no, are you sure it's me? And then she's like, it's your password. It's, it's you. Um, stop being stupid. I'm like, okay, well, it's just a big deal. Uh, so, so yes, then uh, I moved to, to Michigan and I, I, I was there for a year as, um, as an assistant professor. Oh, something that I forgot I wanted to ask you. I have heard that for uh, veterinary uh, uh, specialists, um, in addition to passing your specialist boards, you have to have published in an academic journal. Right. Yeah. Depending on, on uh, your specialty, you need to, to meet certain requirements. And definitely passing the test is, um, is one. And <laughs> You don't get your diploma if you don't do it. For ACVIM, so the American College of Veterinary Internal Medicine, um, you then have subspecialties. You have internal medicine, oncology, cardiology, for example. And you need to pass a general exam uh, on your second year of residency. And that's the same exam for all the specialties under the umbrella of ACVIM. And then you have your specialty exam at the, um, the end of year three. And then in addition to, to the test, you have... Uh, to publish at least one paper uh, on a peer-reviewed uh, journal. And there's also other requirements that you just meet during your residency. So journal club hours, um, teaching rounds, um, some, some um, specialties probably have. You, you need to present at a conference, for example. Um, so there are, there are many requirements. The, the more known ones are going to be obviously passing the test and or tests and in publishing a paper yes right the reason i ask about publishing the paper is that this is not a requirement for um human physicians when they go to get their um their their specialty certification right. they don't have to publish a paper in their field um and i i, I was talking to a um a veterinary residency trained criticalist uh, recently, and he was complaining about this, the fact that you had to publish a paper, you know, before you could get your certification. Um, and he, he felt that it was flooding veterinary medicine with all of these, you know, these studies that a lot of vets complain about. You look, you look at the human studies and it's N equals 30,000. N right. equals 40,000. And in veterinary medicine, I, f I frequently see articles where it's N equals 14. <laughs> and this criticalist uh, or residency trained, he wasn't yet certified, but um, he, 
he felt that that requirement was actually negatively affecting the body of information in veterinary medicine. Do you have any thoughts or feelings about that? It, it, it depends. It, it, I agree with you in terms of the end, the ends for the, the studies to be quite low compared with medicine, but that's also a reflection of the, the caseload that we have. A lot more people that are pets. Um, I agree that there should be papers that you could have more cases enrolled, but then that also in, means that the paper is going to, if it's a prospective um, study, it's going to take a lot longer to, to finish. And yes, you have all these residents that need to have papers uh, ready by the time they, they finish the residency. So yes, there might be some papers that are really literally to to meet that requirement, uh, and you just want to be done with it because that's that's your mentality when you're uh, in the residency. You you want to meet that requirement as early as possible during your residency, so you can stop thinking about. It. You can just check check that one out and look at the the remaining things. You don't want to be dealing with your paper when you're studying for boards. Studying for boards, you just sit down, buckle up, and you do that all day long for multiple weeks at a time. Uh, so uh, I do agree to to some extent on on some of those comments. Um, and that's something that there's there's always talk about. Is there a better way to um, to go around these things? Back in the day, there were case reports for um, ACVIM. That was way before my my time, and then things changed. So I'm not sure if that there's a a great way to go about it. It's most of the residency programs are going are um, forming clinicians and not scientists per se. Uh, so most residents also are going to be done with a paper and, and not look back. Um, so it, it really depends on, on the program. Some, some programs also you come out with a, with a master's degree. Uh, if it's um, included on your program, um, you, where you have classes um, during your residency time, basically, to, to meet some of the, um, the credits you need. So it really depends on, on the program, but from a college perspective, college in terms of um, specialty college, the requirements are going to be different. Uh, at least, for example, for, for surgeons, I think that at least a few years ago, uh, and I don't know if it's still the same, you could not sit for the exam if your paper was not accepted for publication. So many surgeons would be just set back because they couldn't even sit for the exam which just adds additional stress to the, to the whole thing. I don't know if there's a, a better way to do things, um, but it's, it's tricky sometimes. Oh, there's always a better way to do things. <laughs> I just found that fascinating. I didn't know that until this criticalist said that to me. And, uh, you know, then I, I, I asked uh, some human doctors. They were like, nope. I was like, huh. Well, no. Right. <laughs> so... Um, when you were at MSU as a, um, the assistant professor for a year, uh, how was that? It was good. It was definitely, uh, again, that's what makes me say that there are so many things that when you're an intern, resident, vet student, you have no idea what's happening behind the scenes. If uh, for the, the positions above you, kind of, um, it was good. It was definitely um, a good experience because now I was out of a residency and I had to step up and, and, and be teaching these residents and they were coming to me with questions. So it, it, it's definitely challenging uh, when you're just out of your residency and now you, you're in a completely different role. I did enjoy it quite a bit because I, I enjoy teaching and it's difficult uh, on, on one, one hand to, to deal with that. Um, everyone is looking up to you. Uh, students or in residence, there's usually a line of people waiting to ask you questions. But it's very rewarding when, when you make that resident intern student to, uh, you're explaining something, they're like, oh yeah, I get that now. That's, that makes a, a lot of sense. And just kind of see that light bulb go, go on and, and uh, you know that person is hopefully not going to forget that um, because that makes total sense to them and they can apply it to, to their patients. 
Now, as a as a graduate of a non AVMA accredited uh, veterinary school, when you came to the United States, because you went directly into um, academic internship and academic residencies, you did not need to do what other foreign graduates of non AVMA accredited schools needed to do, which was to get uh, certification through. Um, uh, the what is it? The ECFVG. So yep. SCFVG, ECFVG, or the PAVE. Yeah. So these are uh, sort of um, programs that verify that even though you went to school in a different country at a non-accredited AVMA accredited vet school, you still have the knowledge and skills. Uh, acceptable to practice here. So you did not have to do that because you went directly into academic internship, academic residency, right? Yes, I, yes. And that depends on the, on the state as well. So for Washington State, no, you did not because you practice under the uh, academic license of the teaching hostel. I do know that, for for example, for Texas, you would have to, to get the Texas license, state license to even be able to, to work um, there. Um, but yeah, I did not. And Cornell was the same thing. If, as, a, as a resident, um, you, you could practice under the academic license of the hostel. Um, after you, after you got your, um, after you passed your boards and you, you were certified in internal medicine, did you then have to get ECFVG or, or PAVE uh, certification? Uh, I do have to do that if I want to practice in certain states. When I applied for, uh, I did apply for a New York state license. And at the time they were evaluating credentials themselves. So they approved my education in order to get a, a license through their own state. Um, when you become board certified, there are states that will give you um, either a specialist license or they will uh, reciprocate your license from another state. But it's really state um State, there, there are different laws in each state to that say what you can or can't do. Uh, again, Texas requires uh, ECF or, or pay the same thing with other um, states, regardless if you're, if you're board certified or not. It doesn't matter. So if I wanted to work in one of those uh, states that require it, I would have to do it regardless of the fact that I've been in the U.S. for, for this long and the fact that I've been educating students and interns, residents, etc., and talking to um, referring veterinarians all along, they, they don't really see that. They just say, okay, AVMA has these rules and we're just going to follow what they say which doesn't really make a whole lot of sense in my opinion. If I was coming from Portugal to work in the U.S., uh, absolutely. Um, you want to make sure that I have the skills and the knowledge to, to, to say I'm equivalent to an American-educated um, veterinarian, period. There's no, no question there. But when you, and, and I'm not talking about myself, and just in general, if you're a board-certified specialist, regardless of whatever specialty, specialty and you've been practicing in the U.S. for, for this long at high, um, world-renowned practices, why do you still have to show that you're equivalent to an American-educated veterinarian? It makes no sense. You've been teaching those people for years now. But there's a, there's a big financial component as well on the ECFEG and PAVE uh, that I would assume that... Um, certain institutions don't want to to go see go away but it, it is what it is yeah right <laughs> um so you did not want to uh, i mean apparently you didn't want to stay an academic clinician you, you you transferred to private practice what was your reason for wanting to go into private practice rather than stay in academia uh, the main reason really was lack of academic positions Oh, okay. Um, I, I do. I do enjoy academia uh, quite a bit. There are um, there are just not as many academic positions open, and, and you're going to be. It's going to be a lot harder to to get one compared with a private practice job, especially if you don't have a PhD. Um, if you have one, then yes, you're going to be more qualified to those positions. And also it depends if they're looking for a tenure track position or uh, a clinical track position. Because if when I think that when I was 
finishing my position at MSU, all the positions that were open were tenure track, which I am not a good candidate for. Uh, I don't have a PhD. I don't have a lot of research um, projects. Uh, I don't have a, a history of um, publications. I don't have um, grants that I, I got in the past. So anyone with um, with those uh, qualifications or things um, under their uh, in their bag, then they're going to pass me very very easily and quickly. So that's that's one of the reasons. I didn't know that. So typically, if you if a tenured position at an, at an academic teaching hospital is your ultimate goal, your chances of getting that are going to be lower if you're only only board certified. Right. You yeah, also if, if, need a PhD. Wow. Ideally, yes. That's if you look on on the program, this or not program the the position descriptions. They always are going to say that a, a master's PhD uh, or other advanced degree is, is going to be uh, preferred or uh, beneficial for your application. Um, so again, if you have a PhD versus someone that doesn't have a PhD, the PhD person is going to be ahead of you. Period. Right, because those tenure positions. Things. I mean, part of their job is is not just to teach, but it's also to write grants and bring in right. money for the teaching hospital. Right. So if you don't have if you don't have um, a, a history of having those things and, and, and a, a nice um, publication list, then yes, you're it's going to be very hard for you to to land a tenure track position, unless you're the only one person that's applying. And even then, they might not give you the position because of that. That's, they're not looking for someone like me, for example, for a tenure track position. Wow. So, I mean, I can't imagine how in one lifetime you would even have time to get board certified and, in, for instance, internal medicine and get a PhD. I'm sure some people do. But, I mean, so it sounds like if a tenure track position in an academic uh, institution is your goal, rather than getting board certification in one of the specialties, a PhD would be better. Uh, you need both. Both? And, uh, and, board. Right. And, unless you, you're applying for a tenure track position on um, some, something that's not going to be clinical per se. So let's say virology. Yes. Bacteriology. Uh, then yes, you're, right. So you're, and even for bacteriology, you can be, you can board certified through the American I forget the exact name, so I'm not going to say it because uh, I don't want to be be wrong on that. But there's a, a board certification for microbiologists. Uh, what it just depends. Some people will have a PhD even before going into vet school. Some people achieve board certification and and do a PhD afterwards. They will be away from clinics for for a few years, and I can I can see that being a little tricky coming back into clinics after being away for a while. And there are some programs where you get your PhD at the same time. North Carolina State has a, a dual um, PhD internal medicine uh, board, surf, uh, not surf, uh, excuse me, um, PhD residency uh, program, which I believe it's five years where you do both. Wow, that is that is a level of dedication I can't even I can't even conceive. <laughs> um, okay, so then um, in private practice now, um, you're you're in Massachusetts, and your wife is there with you, and she's she's an oncology resident. So, and you mentioned that she w she gave you the results of your board exam um, over the phone as you were driving to um, MSU. So. How do you guys, I mean, you must both be incredibly busy people. Like, how have you managed to maintain your relationship while you're trying to, you know, build your careers? And, and there's so much like, you, you know, you don't know where you're going to be going next necessarily. Because like you said, you know, that that position was not something that was going to last forever at, at, at MSU. And Right. It, well, things actually worked quite well for us uh, considering the, the circumstances. We actually met when I was about to leave Washington State. So we did all my residency, we were apart. So I was in Ithaca, New York, and she was still finishing vet school at Washington State. And I would fly uh, to see her and vice versa as often as we could, which was obviously not often enough um, for, for obvious reasons. 
And then when I finished my residency, she, she started her internship in Michigan. So we, Michigan was actually where we first lived together for real. Um, while I was at Michigan state and she was at private practice in, um, near Detroit. So yes, it's definitely hard, but you can make it work. You have to, there's, it's challenging, but if you really want something bad, then you work towards it. Hmm. So she was doing an internship in, in Michigan while you were at MSU. And then when you, um, but then you, you moved, first you went to, after MSU, the first private practice you went to was in New York. Am I remembering yes. that correctly? Yeah, we work in, working in New Jersey. And, and, and then her, where is her residency? She's at Tufts. Oh, she's at Tufts. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So when you were in New York, were you separated again? For, for a few months, yes. We moved to New Jersey um, for me to work in New York. Um, at that point, she, was, she always wanted to do ophthalmology or oncology. And she wasn't sure which one she wanted to go for. So we just decided that it was better to figure that out before applying. And, and then she ended up at Tufts. And, um, and then when she started, I was still finishing my contract down in, in New York. So we were away for, I think, four or five months. Right. Well, I, I'm impressed with um, your dedication academically and, uh, wow, to, to, your, to your marriage. When, when did you get married? 2014. Not that long ago. Congratulations. Not that long ago. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> and so together, the two of you decided to create this blog, vetmedsurvivalguide.com. Mm -hmm. But when did you decide to do that? And why did you decide to do that? Yeah, so that, that was interesting. It, since I basically started my the, the internship, there's always students that come to you for, for advice. Um, because they they want to know how did you get an internship? How what do I do to get a residency? Um, I don't know what I want to do. Do I want to go to private practice to as an ER doctor? Do I want just want to be a, a general practitioner? So that has happened over the years since I started my internship back in 2010. And after I left Michigan State, that kind of stopped to some extent because going to private practice, I just had less um, access to students for students to ask me that question per, um, in person. And that just happens to everyone. And then when we moved here uh, to, to mass, there was one student that asked my wife if she could come over one day and just chat about internships and, and specialty medicine in general. And after that conversation, I just thought, well, why, why not create something that could be of use for every vet student out there uh, instead of just having a restricted number of people that know me or my wife or know you or know someone that, that's, a fa that's a faculty member at some university or why should you be limited to the faculty members, residents at your own university? What are other people doing? What, what do they, uh, what there's, what are they, their experiences? What, what are they doing in their quest to become specialists? Or even if they don't want to be specialists, just DVM life in general. What, what's, what's it like? What should I do? So that, that's where it, it came from. It was really, okay, well, you know what? I've, I've been through a lot of things. Um, being non, being um, going to vet school in, in Portugal and having to go through all these extra hurdles and to, to become board certified in, in the U S and my wife, the same thing. She, she's an American educated veterinarian, but she had other, um, other difficulties uh, in her um, career and in her path to, to be, uh, to become a resident. So why not just share those things with, with other people out there and with other vet students that, everyone uses their phone or computer. So here you go. This is what, what we went through. This is some information that we wish we had back in the day. And yes, I, I wish I knew as much as uh, when I was applying for internships or when I didn't match for the first year for my residency, because I, I didn't know. I just had to ask a bunch of people and, and kind of, like I said earlier, gamble and decide, well, you know what, I'm going to stay in the U S and I'm going to say no to all these internships in, in the, in the UK. 
and hope that it's going to be okay. And it turned out that it was great. I met my wife, I got the residency, and here we are. So that's, that's how it went. Yes, but having, having, uh, having the information ahead of time rather than having to learn it the hard way yourself <laughs> could never hurt, I think. Right, so, right. Yeah, I think, I, I think that's great. And I, I thought your book was amazing. Like if I would say anybody even considering pursuing internship residency needs this book. It's just chock Thank full you. of practical information stuff that I don't know how you would know otherwise. Uh, that's the thing you don't. And that's why I decided to, to get it out. This, yes, you can say, well, this is just you and your, your wife. And I'm like, okay, that, that's fair, but it's better than nothing. It's better than you being limited to the people at your university or wasting hours researching all these things. And you should still do those things again, because you're, you're trying to learn more. But if you want something that, has the experience of these two people and all of, all of this background information should you can just get it yeah if, and i don't think it i mean it's not just that it's the experience of you and your wife i mean these are i think you're answering the questions that you had when you were going through the process and yet didn't have the answers to until you stumbled upon them um you know through great effort and stress and right. I think they're questions that anybody following this path would have. And now they're yeah, answers. Those are the, yes, I totally agree with you. Those are the questions that we've been asked multiple times over, over the years that every single student has, if, even if they're not strongly considering the going for, for specialty medicine, you don't know what's going to happen. Um, some, some, some of them will just go for internships two, three years later on, for example. Uh, and like you said, it's definitely important to know what's ahead of you. Easy example would be the scramble, as I mentioned earlier. If you never went through the match, you have no idea what happened during that day. You just get the message, yes, you match, and then you don't have to do anything else and, and just celebrate. Or you get the message like, we both did, my wife and I, and it says, well, you didn't match. Sorry, try again next year. It doesn't say that, but basically that's what, how you feel. Um, try again next year, and here are some open positions. Check them out. Uh, and if you don't really know what you're supposed to do, you're just going to be running to try and, and talk to your mentors and for information versus if you have a, a somewhat of an idea, you can ask the right questions to your mentors. You can already prepare yourself in terms of what to do. And you don't have to buy the book to get those, um, some of those answers or information. There's, we have a lot of um, blog posts on our website that just give you all that information for free if you want to. Uh, obviously, the book has a lot more detail uh, and, and has uh, um, more, more advice, but the basics, everything is on the blog for free. The book, I mean, it makes you, it, it can make you more efficient as you go through the process, but it also brings your stress level down considerably. Just uh, feeling you know where you're going. Yeah. Yeah. And it's a, it's a very stressful process. I mean, this is it, a it very sure is, yeah. stressful career in general. And uh, like you've gone through, you've gone through so much more than most veterinarians do. You've, you've worked so much harder, you've experienced so much more stress and uh, all the uncertainty of, of going from, you know, vet school to internship, internship to residency, and then trying to find your way after that. How do you feel now that, that you've gone through all that? Are you glad that you did it? It's definitely a relief to be done with all of that. It's um, knowing that I don't have to, to study for a test again per se, it's great. You're not going to ever stop studying. Uh, if there's anyone out there that thinks that being a veterinarian or a doctor in general, and you don't have to study again, then it's not, obviously. Um, I, yes, I'm, I'm glad that I went through all of this. Um, would I be, if I was starting now, would I do it all over again? Hard to say. <laughs> That's what Probably everybody not. says, who's, who's worked really hard and gone through a lot to get where they're at. <laughs> yeah, because you, when you're there, it's really hard. And then you take the next step and it's even harder. And 
you just go through it. Um, but, but yes, if I definitely would do it again in terms of um, becoming a specialist because I, that's really what I wanted to do. It's, I don't want to be, I love seeing puppies and, and kittens and, um, and, and, and give them vaccines and obviously general practice. That's not, I'm not saying that that's what all it is. Uh, I wish to, I'm sure that some people wish that that was the case, but I really enjoyed the, the internal medicine cases, the, again, the thrill for, for the diagnosis to find out what, what's wrong. Fair enough. Sometimes we don't. And that that's more often than I would like, but it's, I would do it again. I wish I knew more about certain struggles and challenges of our profession when I was just starting. It wouldn't change, but um, I think vet students in our profession in general need to be more aware of what we're facing in a, in a job market. Not from, from uh, getting a job per se, but just when you have that job and um, what you're against, basically. It's, it's not all about the, the pets. It's the uh, pet parents and uh, um, how, how hard it, it sometimes is to to do what we need to do. It's not just, this is the plan and here we go. There's a lot more negotiating than you really wish. Yes, yes, yes. Another thing that we, um, we, try to, uh, we try to package and give back to the people coming behind us, <laughs> you yeah. and I both, because I think uh, even though I didn't go nearly as far as you did, I, I definitely had that experience of uh, wait a minute! I did, nobody told me about this. <laughs> right, there's so many things that no one tells you. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And you do mention that when you started vet school, you did you weren't aware of the emotional and psychological challenges um, that are so prevalent in veterinary medicine. And uh, now that you've come all this way, um, what are do you have any insights on it? Uh, what are your thoughts? Did you have any personal struggles with these issues yourself? Um, I think everyone does to some extent. Uh, I don't think there's any veterinarian out there or vet student that can say that they never had um, struggles in general. Even again, even if you have the backup, uh, when you're a vet student, you have the intern or the resident or the faculty to help you out with a case or with a difficult client, that's still going to be there. And that's part of your education. Um, I think that compassion fatigue is going to be is present in probably every single day, um, just because of. And it depends on the case, and, and every single day might be a little too, too much. But it's it's something that it's, it's over our profession um, quite a bit. Uh, but some of it is um, ethics fatigue, I would think as well. That, like I was saying earlier, just the the simple fact that it's not, this is what your dog needs. This is what, from a medical standpoint, we, we need to do. Uh, and then you can't do that. And you end up euthanizing that pet that could actually have lived if, he, if you had the resources to deal with, um, with the condition, whatever that was. So I think that, that uh, it's important to, to also keep in mind. And that happens with everyone, not just general practice but even at the specialty um, practice level because not everyone that comes to me can can spend thousands of dollars for a workup on um hemolytic anemia or um, or has the ability to do uh, an upper and lower gi endoscopy for example Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. do you have any um advice to uh, future veterinarians as to uh, how do you how do you handle these kinds of uh, stressors and Uh, I personally try to for example when I'm euthanizing a a pet uh, for and again most of the times when I euthanize them is because there's nothing else I can do uh, versus a general practice emergency uh, type of practice and that's going to be completely different I basically just say to myself well we tried and there's nothing else I can do and and I don't, I just basically f- shut down my brain and just think, well, okay, I'm euthanizing this pet, but I just forget about it in terms of this is 
I'm, it's a little hard to explain because um, this is, I think that this is very personal in terms of what I do. I just, like I said, shut down my brain and forget that I'm euthanizing a pet. I'm basically thinking, okay, your suffering is uh, over now. Uh, and then that's it. But that works for me. That's kind of a, um, something I, I've always done. And it's not that it makes it easy or anything close to that. It just makes it less hard, I would say. But every, every single, one, single person will have a, uh, a way to cope with, uh, with these things because you're going to have to cope with these things um, somehow, uh, either by yourself or uh, with, with the help of your family, significant other, or if it's with um, a therapist or um, whoever it is, your classmates, your um, co-workers, you need to have someone to to work with you um, in these things. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah, I think that's a really interesting uh, perspective or advice. Like you, you need to find your own way of coping with these stresses. And uh, I guess there's, there's a lot of trial and error there. Uh, right. Yeah. And, and your personality is going to be, for example, that obviously does not work um, for my wife. Her personality is completely different from mine. Um, so I, I can compare, compartmentalize things a little easier than she than she can but it's 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 hard it's it's a learning uh be not behavior it's a learning uh situation for everyone from again as soon as you hit the clinic floor on your fourth year until board certification or if you're just in in practice for five years ten years one year it doesn't matter you're always working on that and uh like I said, awareness is, is really important in my, in my mind. And, and part of, um, of the, the other reason why I created the, the blog with my wife is just, hey, I did, we didn't really know about these things. Here they are. This is not an all-inclusive thing. You go out and, and look for, for these things. Get more information. We have a lot of links on, on some of the, the posts. Uh, on on the compassion fatigue and the, the challenges and struggles of for um, for us, some of those also apply to um, vet uh, vet techs as well. Um, but the goal is not for people to just read them and and, and then be done with them. It's to click the links and look uh, for more information because you really need to. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. It's interesting what you said about you're better at compartmentalizing than your wife. I think this is. <laughs> pretty much true <laughs> across the board in terms of major differences between men and women and how we right. process emotions. Cause my husband is very good at compartmentalizing and uh, uh, for me, and I think for most women, there's no boxes, you know, separate boxes, you know, everything touches and is interconnected with everything else. <laughs> It's just fascinating. But I wonder sometimes if, if that might make it a little bit easier for men emotionally because they're good at compartmentalizing. And uh, I know that it's not reflected in terms of like the suicide rates. Um, it's not that women are committing suicide more frequently than men are in veterinary medicine. But right. Men might also be hiding it a little bit more. Mm-hmm. Interesting. Uh, I would say. Uh, just because again, they're men and they're not supposed to show emotions and, and all of those things, which I don't think that's the case. You should, and, and if you're having trouble, you should seek help, period, regardless of your sex. But I wonder if that plays a role. Oh, that's a really good point. Yeah, I thought that must be hard. <laughs> you guys have this <laughs> image to keep up, you know, and that's not no, really- I don't think so. It, 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 I mean, some people might see it that way, but again, it's the the whole "I'm so tough uh, because I'm a man," or that that's just I don't want to say stupid, but well, I think if it's you're, stupid. If you're, str- but... if you're struggling, go go out and seek help because in our profession and other medical professions and others as well, that the just the rate of mental illness is just so high that it. it it needs to be addressed. And to some extent, I always think, I also think that our profession to some extent allowed um, some of the bullying and, uh, and some of the things that we face to, to, to be more prominent just because of um, 
that desire of always pleasing everyone. Uh, that that's very something that we we do as a profession. Uh, and yes, you, your your job is to help a, a, the pet parent and the pet, but it's not just to do every single thing that they want to and just for you to do. Um, uh, I mean, if if you want to take abuse and then again with social media and all of that, people are just, it's, it's a lot more prominent than, than before. And we're not supposed to, to take all that abuse, even, even in uh, during the appointments, it's, there needs to be a stop to all of this. But it's so, it's so prominent as well. And I'm, I'm assuming it's, it's prominent in human medicine as well. I'm not sure if it's as prominent as, as with us uh, because everyone, I think the expectations are just, completely different uh, if, if it's me that needs an ultrasound I, I go for an appointment and i'll get an ultrasound three weeks from now or endoscopy who knows when that's going to happen a month from now maybe versus if someone comes to to see you uh, or someone else then everyone's demanding that everything happens the same day which it's not always doable mm-hmm. yeah absolutely Oh, well, thank you so much for being so generous with your time and your advice. Yeah, of course. I loved hearing about your experiences, and uh, it's been eye-opening. Is there anything that I haven't asked you that you would like to talk about? Um, there's probably just a, a couple things in terms of for, from a vet, vet student standpoint. Um, that it's also things that we don't really get taught in school. Uh, one is about uh, medical uh, mistakes. Those should always be um, it's, no matter how small they are, uh, medical mistakes are not, uh, or errors are not just when a patient dies because you did something wrong or made a mistake. But also, in terms of, for example, there was a, a case in um, when during my residency where we got some culture samples for for a patient and asked for liver aspirates, and the student. Drop, dropped them on the floor. So all the samples were gone because they just shattered. And then it was not a big deal because we just had to get new samples. But even something as simple as that needs to be disclosed to, to the client because, you know what, it's no big deal. Yes, we need to, to do get some new samples. There's the, the risks again. But there's no point in hiding any of that because that's what's potentially going to give you uh, more trouble coming after uh, if if it gets the client knows about it afterwards and you didn't disclose that. So I think that's something that no one teaches you in school. And it's always that, oh, shoot, I made a mistake. I'm going to hopefully no one notice. No, you, you definitely need to acknowledge that you made a mistake so that you don't make it again, for example. Um, so that that's definitely one thing that uh, you... Um, I would like to, to mention. And the other thing is, if you're a student, um, remember that you're in vet school to learn how to be a doctor. You're not there just to get knowledge inside your brain and, and then everything is going to happen easily and like automatic after the fact because that's not what it is to, to be a doctor. You're, you're supposed to, to be active and, and use that knowledge that people are giving you in an active way so that when you get on clinics, you can act like the doctor. Remember that you have the, the backup. You, you're the doctor. Think of your cases as you're the primary doctor, like if you were alone. Come up with a plan and then present your plan to you, the intern or resident or faculty. And then if you're right, fantastic. If you're not right, well, guess what? People are going to steer you in the right direction. And then next time you, you'll know better. Mm-hmm. That's the time to make your thinking mistakes. Right, right, right. And I think that, and this is obviously a biased observation from when I, when I started my internship to, uh, to now, is that it seems that over time, more and more um, students are in the mentality of, I don't really have to think actively about all these things. I'm just going to get all this knowledge. And then when I go out there in the real world, all of this is going to magically happen. Uh, there seem to me to be a little, somewhat a little more passive, which it, it shouldn't happen. It's again, you're the doctor, even though you're just a student and you think you're doing a lot of student things slash tech thing, but y- you really need to learn there. There's people to help you out. Great. 
Fantastic. Um, do you have any uh, favorite charities that you'd like to mention? And uh, if people find value in, in what you've given them today, which I'm sure they will, maybe they can consider making a donation to them. Yeah, I have um, three. One is the Pullman um, Humane Society. It's Pullman Humane Society. That's where it's a city where Washington State University is. Um, that's where we adopted our um, little dog from. Um, so they're they're great. You might also consider the um, Washington State has a Good Samaritan Fund. That um, that's used to when for patient, patients that have diseases that can be fixed per se or help to some extent. Um, people can can apply for for those funds. And uh, the Cornell University for um, Animals Hospital also has um, a hospital fund for for the same uh, reasons. Not called Good Samaritan Fund, but um, you can specify that you specifically want to give to the teaching hostel, which will um, support some clients with uh, financial difficulties as well. That's that, Those are great, great suggestions. Thank you. Well, um, thank you so much for your time, Dr. Dr. Bento. And, uh, of course, my pleasure to be here. It's been, it's been a pleasure getting to know you and, and hearing all about your life and experiences. Yeah, and, thank you. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> thank you for inviting me. It's, um, it was a pleasure. Thank you.